Team Blue enters chat with a baseball bat and just goes absolutely mental on value. Good afternoon morning and welcome to Turbid Sort of Tech. If you're new here, I'm Reese of the Four Piece Variety or Get Triple XL. And today we have the most auspicious occasion of being part of a brand new GB launch from Team Blue. So now it's Team Blue versus Team Red versus Team Green. Now all that has to happen is Nvidia needs to start making CPUs and then my life can be very, very difficult. <laughs> but your lives as consumers actually just improved significantly because this is very much like the PS3 launch. As much as the PS3 was a good cheap way to play back Blu-rays, this has now become the cheapest way to eliminate the streaming PC because this is the cheapest AV1 encoding uh, GPU around. And there is a release on OBS uh, beta at least for AV1 encoding. I didn't have a chance to test it and load it fully as much as I wanted to. This review is going to center mainly around gaming performance and what you can expect out of the GPU for its sort of primary role within your system. But the fact that it does include AV1, just separates it from the rest of the pack. You've got to buy an NVIDIA 40 series to be able to get access to that. And same, similarly on AMD, you've got to buy a 7000 series. So come with 20K or no AV1 encoding for you. That's rough. Not a lot of South Africans are probably going to go in for that. And even on an international standpoint, you know, bring $800 or 280. Now I'll drop to 225. By Intel, thank you Intel for the extra discount. It just made it significantly more competitive, uh, especially against the very popular RTX 3060. So yeah, Intel's really, really aggressively coming into the market. And it's very good for all of the consumers. Anyway, something that I just want to mention before we move along is the packaging. The way that Intel packages stuff at the moment, is just absolutely fantastic. Except that you baited me. And I'm a little bit annoyed. Look at me right now in my eyes and tell why have you done this to the curious cat? Because there's a cutout over here. And when I pulled it out, I was like, oh, what cool hidden thing is underneath it. It's just a box. And it's just so you can remove the inner insert like from the inside. There's absolutely no point to this from what I can see. Thank you for debating me. Cool little card up top though. Just thanking you. This is the way that your Founders Edition Intel Arc will come packaged. It's going to be very interesting to see how other PCB manufacturers like MSI and XFX and Asus, etc., then react to the card and make their own variants. I'm actually quite curious because honestly, for a Founders Edition card, Intel kind of knocked it out of the park. And that is a nice segue into looking at the all new hotness from Intel. I especially like the branding. It's really tastefully and subtly done. It does overexpose a little bit on the camera because it's very bright, the LED over here, and the Intel arc on the side, but it looks absolutely fantastic. The fans as well look really good, uh, especially because they didn't put a sticker on the center of the fan, so it just kind of looks like two speakers, which, is, which I'm kind of a fan of. And it's incredibly dense, this thing. It weighs like six gajillion tons somehow, and um, it's quite a hefty, beefy boy, which tells me that there's actually a lot of copper going on in there, and it's why I basically have no fan curve results. I slapped it on Ada for 48 minutes. It just sat at 784 degrees with 100% uh, uh, GPU usage and VRAM usage, and it was topping out at like 180 watt. So 225 watt is the power delivery for this card. So I didn't see anything close to that, which is really good. Um, so it does run pretty damn efficiently, even at max chat. So that's good for that AV1 encoding usage as well. If you are using it just as an encoder, you don't need to go out and get, you know, a 1200 watt platinum series power supply uh, to be able to run this in a system with a decent GPU. You probably can top out at a kilowatt. I don't think you'll need more than a thousand watt power supply to be able to run this in a system as your sort of encoding platform. Like, so really good job on that. Back of the cards also nicely finished. The matte finish, I'm not the biggest fan of, you know, sticky fingers and stuff are gonna mess it up. It's not gonna really be under like a lot of usage unless you're using it on a test bench all the time and taking it off and on. Uh, in which case, I mean, it's it's easy enough to clean and stuff. There's no, there's nothing inherently bad about it. I just, yeah, sticky fingerprints on stuff really just sends the OCD into the overdrive. Anyway, before I digress too far, from the topic at hand, let's talk about its competition and the test bench setup and how we've gone about testing this GPU. So, RTX 2070 Super from NVIDIA because uh, a tech power up charts showed that it should be about 7% on average ahead, which is 
kind of in line with what I got. You'll see as we go through the performance results. And then uh, similarly from AMD, I took the RX 6700 because the 6600 XT and this share spec for a lot of the way through, um, just a little bit more resources and stuff on this card. So we were expecting the AMD to be better, but it's price versus performance is really good. These are seven and a half thousand Rand new. Uh, these you can find on the second hand market right now for about 5k. Um, that being said, it is a second hand card that'll be two to three years old. So no warranty or anything that will come with that. Uh, and it is significantly larger and, <laughs> and more overbuilt. Just bearing in mind, this is 2070 Super Gaming X. I mean, it's one of the top cards from that era um, of 20 series GPUs. And I've just refurbished it and the performance is like it's hitting 62 degrees on the core. So it's having a good time. It's chilling, right? Then we have the Intel Arc A750. It is the founder's edition of the GPU and it did hit 2.4 gigahertz. It has had no problems because I've had resizable bar and everything enabled with our very good baseline test pitch. Thank you once again, Intel and MSI. Z690 Torpedo with a data XPG, 5200 megahertz, CL38, Combining that with uh, an 850 watt power supply from Deepcool, 850 watt gold. So more than enough power provision for these 180 watt, you know, guzzling GPUs. <laughs> and then, yeah, the guzzling uh, 13600K clapped at 225 watt. So yeah, it pushes just a little bit of clock. I, I did take off the 5.4 gigahertz and let it run at 5.1 uh, for these uh, benchmarks because that's not what we're really testing over here. We're obviously doing GPU tests. So. Uh, oh, and the storage, uh, it's just a normal 2 TB Western Digital NVMe. So everything is more than well spec for this level of graphics card. I mean, the graphics card is six grand, the processor new is seven. So the, just the processor is more than the GPU, which is not really how you would spec your machine anyway. So I hope it's up to your taste and, and, and obviously it's water cooled as well. So I hope it's up to your taste and discerning palette, let's put it that way. Anyway, I've got to stop my digression once again, because it's time to talk about some benchmarks. So, DirectX 9, let's kick it off with CS. But things did not go well. 1% lows, absolutely schmeckled. But now let's immediately flip the script with Metro, uh, DirectX 12 test, and oh, look at that. It absolutely shellacks both cards. It's, what's especially impressive to me is that yes, this is a first generation RTX product, but in general, AMD is lost there as well. And both the Intel and AMD kept up and the Intel just absolutely destroyed it. Look for the most part, if you look at things like Vermintide and DirectX 11 testing, you're gonna see a better median of results. Things like Dota 2 as well, ran exceptionally well with DirectX 11. This Hope Source 2 with the new CS2, which is on the precipice, is gonna help sort out that problem that we see with CSGO. So it should get better as DirectX 11 becomes like more mainstay. It is a DirectX 12 type of card, so it's, it's not, we were expecting DirectX 9 performance to not be quite that good, right? Like, I think that's in line with the expectations. And the rest of the gaming benchmarks are pretty damn good, uh, especially in things like Crisis. I didn't expect it to keep up with the RX 6700. It has significantly less resources and stuff. It's no wonder that the RTX wins over there because it has DLSS to help it along as well. And it's not something you can really disable with the benchmark. Bit of a kind of like, mm, like take that with a pinch of salt, that gap. But the remainder, you know, where outside of RTX testing, like RDO2, et cetera, where there's like no DLSS, those things you could sort of take as a more like one for one representation of the result. Um, and yeah, look, NVIDIA DLSS really does make a difference. We're gonna see Intel XESS rolling out, that's their version of DLSS, which will then do super sampling and enhance your uh, sharpness and clarity without a performance knock. So we're gonna have to see how that improves as it goes across the generations. But out of box, for new gaming, basically all of those benchmarks, Fire Strike, 3 Mark, everything included, boils down to basically a 10% difference between the, between the Arc and the RX 6700 and about a 12% difference be, due to mostly due to DLSS and stuff coming out against the RTX 2070 Super. So this is their first generation of a product and it's already competitive. Why I say it's already competitive is this card costs like 20% more than the Intel. So at a price versus frame rate, the Intel, especially when newer games are considered, is significantly further ahead on value. And then it's the same thing versus NVIDIA. It beats out the 3060 12 gig at Wood because it's keeping up with the 2070 Super and Rasterizing, which we know is generally like the, uh, quite a bit ahead of that. 
So this card has more than exceeded my expectations in certain areas. The older stuff, the fact that it doesn't support legacy stuff is a little bit of a drawback for me from a perspective of if I had a retro gaming PC and I wanted a good cheap GPU to put into it to play old games, this is not it. It's never gonna be it. But for newer technologies, AI enhancement stuff, Intel's really focusing hardcore on that, on AI upscaling technologies, etc. And the fact that it has AV1 encoding at this sort of price point and can be loaded to ludicrous levels. I mean, 8064 doesn't just load a machine. What I want you to understand is your desktop stutters, okay? Even that reserve 1% that Windows normally holds onto itself for running your desktop and stuff, Ada even takes that. So like when I'm saving it, it's literally glitching and like stuttering in front of me. That's how I loaded this thing once for 48 minutes and it didn't skip a beat. So construction of these cards is A, a class. The general performance is astounding for newer games. And yes, it, I would think, you know, Intel would focus on that because that's where the trajectory is going into the future. But yeah, you know, I just feel like leaving out DX9, you know, there's a lot of ancestral games and stuff that aren't really going anywhere. And you're now completely reliant on them updating to at least DirectX 11 uh, processing. Vulkan, OpenGL, all of that is all supported on the card as well uh, from by default. So those rendering APIs and stuff will also do quite well. So things like Doom, for instance, that has a Vulkan API built into it, will render out quite well on the, on this card. Um, it's difficult for me to test, you know, a, as much range as I'd like to because a lot of the benchmarks for those games are super unreliable. Um, they don't have a set benchmark run that's easily repeatable. Uh, which is a bit of a problem for me with it. It just creates unreliable data because the environment is dynamic. So your results, unfortunately, are made dynamic with that. But I think I've given you a clear scope as to the performance of this card and the niche that it's going into. And that's why I say it reminds me of PS3 because now it's the cheapest way to get AV1 encoding. Instead of buying an entire streaming PC, as soon as AV1 is full-fledged in OBS, you buy one graphics card. You up to upgrade your power supply, maybe your cooling in your system so there's more airflow so it doesn't heat up your other GPU, and you're for away. You've got pretty much an, like an encoder for free. Or if you did do the second PC, put this in as the graphics card instead of an NVENC even because AV1 is just that much better. It's much better com compression and quality in general. So the fact that they've put that in at this price point is a big takeaway for me and the avenue it's going into. Education and stuff. This thing is going to slay. It's going to sell hand over fist. Anywho, that is all I have for you on the Intel Arc A750. If you have enjoyed this review, please hit us up with a like and subscribe. And I will see you on the flip side. Sweet delight, you are my lucky charm. I hold you close. As much as the PS3 was a good cheap way of playing back Blu-ray, you know, as much as the PS3 was a good cheap way of playing black... <laughs> as much as the PS3 was a good cheap way of using... <laughs> as much... <laughs> Why can't I... <laughs>